And let's see, we've already had that. That's Carlos there. Oh, Carlos sent me the recipe. Remember we were talking on the program? Oh, yeah. About uh, uh, that recipe? Yep. He sent me the recipe. And uh, he said, as promised, here is the recipe to that dish. And then he gave me an address. A few notes, he said, from Glassman. He said, when they say grain, they mean chickpeas. And the beef is cubed. The bacon ain't sliced, but a chunk of bacon so that you can cut thin slices into cubes and the laurel is bay leaf but uh, he sent the recipe here for the uh, for that super stewer I guess they were calling it a soup during the movie yeah. but uh, almost like a stew but uh, everything's in grams so I'm going to have to oh. <laughs> transfer this for my wife you know she goes, I don't know how much that is. I said, I'll transfer it. So, but it's really pretty simple. It's like it's like prep time, 15 minutes, cook time, 45. Ooh. And uh, it's got macaroni, pasta, beef. Um, and this one, I don't know what is. I mean, he explained to me the bacon and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he didn't explain this to me. This is one chorizo blood. C H O R I Z O yeah. one chorizo blood. I know chorizo is like a, isn't that a sausage? Um, hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's a, I, uh, I, that's what I thought. But a blood. pork sausage. Uh, we do take the drippings from the bottom of the pan or the the tray and pour it in there. What? I'm wondering. One chorizo blood. It doesn't say one amount. Just one chorizo blood. Uh, Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yes, I thought. Hmm. 150 grams of macaroni pasta, 500 grams of beef, one chorizo blood, 250 grams of grain, which is chickpea, one onion, three garlic teeth, mm. 100 milligrams of uh, no milliliter size grams, 100 milliliters mm. of white <clears throat> wine. Well, that's good. One teaspoon of paprika, then they go to teaspoons, one <laughs> bay leaf, olive oil, pepper, and salt. Okay. And those are the ingredients. Uh, yeah. They, and mm. uh, it's, it's mm. excuse me, make a stir fry in a pan with a drizzle of olive oil, crushed olive, bay leaf, and chopped onion, and let sear the onion. After joining the cube meat, chorizo into thick slices and bacon into large cubes with paprika, salt and pepper and let the meat gain color. I guess cook it a little bit. Following joint white wine and a glass of water or chorizos the grain uses water to cook the grain and let braise on low heat if necessary and add more water. When the meat is tender add the pasta and a bit of hot water and let it cook when the pasta is almost cooked, add the beans. Let the pasta finish cooking and rectify the seasoning. And that's what it says, rectify the seasoning. So, Okay, I just got a... Beans. Uh, I don't remember reading beans. Just... Uh, hang on a second. Let's see. There's no beans in the ingredient. Chickpeas, I guess. Chickpeas, yeah. I think no, that would... That's a I thought that was... Some beans. I don't. Use, I don't usually eat chickpeas. Um, chorizo blood sausage. Um, it does not contain blood, nor liver, or other parts. It is a mix of pork meat and fat, along with spices, and it's smoked. So it doesn't contain blood, or any like you know what is that you know type of mix in there. But uh, it says uh, chorizo blood. I don't understand why, other than it just has a red what color to it. What chorizo blood? It's, I guess that's one sausage. Uh, it sounds like it. Uh, Spanish blood yep. sausage yep. stuffed with ground pork, pigs. Oh, it does. Now, it's, here's another one. It says Morcilla. Is it Morcilla? Is, oh, Mor Morcilla. Morcilla. Okay, now they're telling you how to pronounce it. Morci Morcilla, I guess. It's a Spanish blood sausage uh, that is popular throughout the country. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I got to buy this. Pigs. Mm. Manipulators are unique. Uh, anyway, it does say that um, 
it has um it does have blood in it so i'm not sure what to i don't know uh first type of sausage made from a slaughtered pig sorry about that uh, all of you uh, anti uh, whatever anti people are uh the ground pork is mixed yeah. with pig's blood along with seasonings and spices chopped onions and filler see you know when you say filler that makes me uh oh usually rice <laughs> and then it's piped into a casing oh, okay <laughs> yeah, filler's like filler. Could you uh, define that possibly? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. It's Halloween. <laughs> filler. <laughs> What's that song by Michael Jackson? <laughs> oh yes, the filler. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can kill it. Kill it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, piped into a casing, <laughs> shaped into cylinders, flash boiled to coagulate the blood, and hung up to. We should have some haunted music when I'm pl- when I'm saying this. This is like uh, this right, it's gonna you know, turn into a story really, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a Halloween type yeah. story here. Yeah, put a little haunted and voice to it. The sheets up to dry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, with the blood on them. <laughs> Move closer to your radio. What was that? The uh, Inner Sanctum back in the what was it twenties or thirties? That uh, old radio show used to scare people. Uh, God, what was that classic oh, radio? Oh, yeah, yeah. Inner Sanctum and The Shadow uh, and all those back Sanctum. in the day. Yeah, that was one of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Those were uh, yeah. those were scary moments before they had I, TV. I heard something funny on the radio. The guy uh, today, a guy on the radio said, Dracula, obviously, blah, blah. I don't want to suck your blood, blah. He said, does he say blah because he doesn't like the taste of it? And that's how he, <laughs> that's letting him know that you, blah, blah. I got to <laughs> suck your blood, blah. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're getting never thought of it, but now I always will. Yep. <laughs> you know? we're, we're getting there, folks. We're working on, you know, blood is red. Oh, red wine. And uh, <laughs> we kind of circle back red. over to the, oh, Yes. Good segue. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, 17 but minutes. But that's the recipe. Yeah. We, well, good. Have, haven't it's, tried it yet. Haven't hmm. done it yet. But he sent it to me. And, uh, yeah. Um, Rancho a Portuguesa. Hmm. And it's a main dish, Portuguese cuisine, 15 minutes prep, cook time, 45 minutes, serves four people. And uh, it looked like a delicious soup. It really did mm-hmm. during the movie. And you know, what's this? There are several ways to make the best known being disclosed to and coming from a visu. The ranch is made with various ingredients, including bacon, and chorizo, wine chorizo, wine chorizo. There's something new for us now. Oh my gosh! No. The sausage, cabbage, pasta, macaroni, or other types, grain, potato, and carrot. <laughs> All the ingredients are cooked in the same water alternately. The water ends up becoming a broth, which must be plentiful at the time the ranch is served. Hmm. So I guess you need to add some more water to be sure it's plentiful. Mm-hmm. Anybody out there who is Portuguese who is listening to us, if we said anything wrong, yeah. then let us know. Oh, I'm sure we but, uh, said many things wrong. I'm sure um, we did. Yeah. We always do, always destroy the words. Um, boy, they have a lot of categories here. They've got cows and desserts and duck and fish and goat and meat and pork and shellfish and soups and starters. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, so uh, that was from our, our guest, uh, what was he on, three weeks ago? Um, Carlos from three weeks ago. Uh, uh, October 7th. Yeah. Did a movie. Mm-hmm. October 7th, yeah. Yep. Okay, so that, that was three weeks ago. <clears throat> yeah, Carlos did a movie, mm-hmm. uh, and he was uh, a, a wonderful kingdom, by the way, since we already gave a plug for joy, let's do this for Carlos also. Absolutely. Uh, he did a movie called A Wonderful Kingdom, which he grew up in Portugal, in the Douro region of Portugal, and he went back and did this movie basically about the people there if you're looking for a wine movie or a port movie it's not it's about the people around there but it's a good movie i enjoyed it it was really interesting and a lot of fun to listen to uh, and watch you can go to youtube and get it you can go to amazon prime and get it i think it's 5.99 on amazon prime mm-hmm. um and uh it, you can go to uh Apple TV, uh, 
Apple TV, yeah, that's yeah. another one they have on. Yeah. It's a wonderful kingdom, uh, is the name of it. So, but uh, they were eating a soup during one part of it, and it just looked absolutely delicious. And he said he had, he sat down with them and ate it, and he said it was absolutely delicious. So I told him to send me the recipe, and he did. And that's what we'd just been talking about was that recipe from. Mm-hmm. From the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, it's it's worth it. Grab a couple of people, sit down in front of the TV, and and watch it. It's an interesting movie. It really uh, concentrates on people. Beautifully filmed, absolutely beautifully filmed. So, and he also brought up something which really surprised me and shocked me. He said that in the Douro region of Portugal, which is the port region. It's been there for centuries, literally centuries. Uh, the land used to be divided up and all the people in the little small plantations or little small areas used to grow their grapes and for their master ruler of the area and they'd all put it in one place and make the ports and all that. But they were actually in servitude for years. Most of their lives they were stuck in servitude growing these grapes and doing it for them. Well, that's changed now, and it's not so bad, but there's still a lot of little small port places there. He said that they have discovered lithium on the land in that area there, which is, wow. Lithium is used for all of your cell phones. It's used in electronics all over the place and all that. It's a a rare mineral, uh, very rare. Uh, In fact, I read a couple years ago that they were afraid they are going to they're getting low on lithium. They didn't know what they were going to do. Well, they found a new source there in the rural region of Portugal. And I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, that's the port region of the world. And if they found lithium, the only way to get lithium is by open strip mine. They don't do caves in underground. It's open strip mines. And it will destroy the region there. So I don't know what's going to happen. I haven't seen or heard anything. That's the first I heard about it through Carlos. And breaking news, I'm telling you, if you haven't didn't listen to the program, that's what's going on there. So it's uh, it's an issue that's coming up, I, I'm sure. So we'll see. We'll see what happens on that. But. That was the recipe we were just talking about, the one that they had on the movie. Check out the movie, Good Chance of a Wonderful Kingdom about Portugal. Okay, well, while I've got the stage here, let me go ahead and talk about some other stuff here. While I'm, let's see, was this, what's one of the things I was going to talk about here, about Carlos? No, not not there. Not there. Oh, the world's best ports. Since Carlos and the Wonderful Kingdom is about port, I found this, the world's best ports listed here. And surprisingly, surprisingly, they're not real expensive. This article, and this is out of uh, Wine Searcher. And Wine Searcher is a good app, by the way, if you don't have it. Excuse me, if you don't have it, it's a good one to have on your phone because, or in your computer, whatever, because uh, it, well, on your phone really is the best place because if you're out shopping or something for wine, winesearcher.com. I don't get any, I think it's wine-searcher.com. I don't get any residuals or anything for promoting this. It's just a good app. I have it on my phone. I've used it for years and it uh, tells about wines. It tells where you can find them. It tells what's a good value, all that stuff. It really is a a very well put together app, and I use it a lot. But the best ports now, the Wine Searcher did an algorithm that ranks the best value wines, and they put this value into ports. So it's not particularly how much a wine costs, it's bang for the buck is really how it's, the, the algorithm works more than anything. It's what, what are you getting in return for the money you're spending? 
So, <coughs> excuse me. So they said by simply dividing the aggregated critic score by the price gives a value factor. And so the higher the value factor, the better the value. So a higher the value factor, the more points per dollar. So all wines have a minimum critic score of 91. But they came up with this Combra de Matos Valris 20 Port value factor of 9.4, which is over double of what the next one is. And they said that that sells for right around $10. And I went, what? $10 for a port with that type of... And they said, yes, it's, it's well-made. It is a good tawny port if you're looking for a tawny port and all that. So uh, I was surprised at how low that price was for this particular port. But it's uh, C-O-I-M-B-R-A-D-E-M-A-T-T-O-S V A L R I Z Tawny Port. So uh, copy that down and take it with you when you're looking for ports because that really is supposed to be an uh, excellent volume. The next one on the list, is, and that was not vintage, by the way, that's just a taunty. Next one on the list, and all the rest of them are vintage. The 2011 Brimster Colihita Port was value factor four. Like I say, the other one was 9.4. This is 4, 4.0. Next one after that was the 2016 Wine and So Pintus Vintage Port at 1.37 value factor. And then the 2017 Wine and So Pintus Vintage Port at 127 value factor. So then on all the rest of them down to 108 value factor, which, you know, that first one at 9.0 is like wow that's really a heck of a buy for what they're doing there so and the port prices he's saying globally have averaged lower than they have in the last couple of years last year port prices were averaging between 23 and 107 dollars this year they've dropped down to 10 to 18 uh, 10 to 88 dollars for uh, average prices so now's a good time to go out and buy yourself some ports if you haven't uh in fact, get yourself a bottle of port and sit down and watch uh, A Wonderful Kingdom and uh, enjoy a bottle of port while you're doing that. Uh, it uh, surprised me the, how well ports are being priced right now. Okay, minerality. I found an article here. I've talked about minerality in, in wines before. And there's a debate, is there really minerality? Is there, do you really detect minerals in wine? I've always heard and I've always been told that the mineral comes from the soil, from what it's around. You can pick up different flavors through the soil into the roots, into the grape. And this is what I've been told and this is what I've learned and this is what I thought was true. Well, this article pretty much says that's BS. A uh, uh, said that minerality uh, is a, a really minerality is acid. It's a the acid that's being picked up. Says recently, scientists such as Alex. Maltman from the University of Wales, Anna Catherine Mansfield from Cornell Department of Food Science, and Carol Meredith from UC Davis Department of Viticulture and Enology have all came out with the same clarification. Tiny amounts of dissolved ions in soils can indeed be absorbed by the roots, but none of them are ever of sufficient enough efficiency to contribute to actual sensations of minerality in a wine's aroma or flavor. That is to say, minerality never comes from soil content. And I went, wow, I always heard that it was, but they are saying that it's not. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this article goes on to say, it reminds him of a quote that he heard many years ago 
from a speaker 35 years ago. He said the speaker, and the speaker was talking about mineralities, and he said, if wines got their flavors from soil, the strawberries I grew as a kid would have tasted like crap since I always used manure as a fertilizer. Hmm. Makes sense. If it picks it up in the soil and puts it in the soil and puts it in the grapes, then, you know, the stuff that you throw on there. So they're saying that mineral, the mineral that you pick up, the mineral, excuse me, the mineral that you pick up, the mineral that you taste is not from the soil, but from the acid. And colder climates will give you more acid than warmer climates. So that's your mineral. That's what you're picking up. Um, and instead of saying I, I'm picking up mineral, you're really they're saying that it would be more appropriate to use the word acid instead of mineral. So all these people who say uh, it's got a lot of minerality to it, and it's you know this article is saying no such thing. It's it's the acid, and what you're doing is different different aspects of the acid but it is acid uh lower acid uh will give you a little bit different profile as opposed to higher acid warmer sites producing grapes uh, are lower in acidity than uh ones that are a cooler site so minerality According to this, and backed up by what I just told you about the, the professors, is just acid. And that acid is affected by the things, by the altitude, by the cold climate, warm climate, by alcohol levels being higher or lower. And the sugars can also affect the acid, which, again, the minerality. So... From now on, any comments on minerality, you don't have to argue with people. You can just shake your head knowingly and understand that that is acid that they're actually referring to and not real mineral. It says, suffice it to say, minerality is often, not always, part of many a wine's terror-related profile, but not, not always for the same reasons. Every vineyard and every wine region is different, and the times and climate are a changing. So that's what makes it all so interesting. So there you go. Um, okay. Glassy, oh, is this the glassy wing sharpshooter? I believe this is the glassy wing. Yes, it is. Glassy wing sharpshooter. I've talked about the glassy wing sharpshooter GWSS in past episodes. I've talked about how it was prominent in Florida and how we have such a problem of growing premium grapes in Florida because of the glassy wing sharpshooter and how it's moving around the world and it's in warm climates and it goes through like a four or five stage cycle and you can't really kill it one time. And on and on and on. Okay, I, you can check past episodes. Go back to archives and they're labeled. Check on Glassy Wing Sharpshooter, the episode, and i tell you all about it and talk all about it. But the reason I bring it up now is because they're finding a bunch of it in California. Oh, no. Yes. And that's has always been the concern in California. Now, California, if you go to California, if you ever traveled into California by car, they have a agricultural station that stops you when you get a few miles across the border. And they ask you if you have any fruits or vegetables or any live plants and all that other stuff. And if you do, you got to short to them. And sometimes they confiscate it and sometimes they just dig down and inspect it. And if the guys really know what they're doing, they know what they're inspecting for so they don't confiscate it. But they are very, very cautious about what comes into the state of California. <laughs> Because of all the fruits and vegetables and grapevines, well, the glass ring sharpshooter can fly. So it flew into California, and it has been spotted 
in Solano County. Back in the early 2000s, it was spotted in Solano County. Um, it's uh, first spotted in uh, Solano County, but it's spotted earlier this month in a residential area of Vacaville, which is also close to where the 2004 infestation was uh, caught. And the numbers have increased. Uh, it hasn't shown signs of spreading to Salon, uh, or spreading to the agricultural areas in Solano County or into Napa. Now, Solano County is up right next to Napa. That's they're they're all in Northern California there, and right in a major wine growing region. So this is it's not good. Uh, we're extremely concerned, said Ed King, who is the Solano County Agricultural Commissioner. He says it's a priority to get rid of these, you know, and you can't blame him. Uh, October the 6th, the county reported finding five glassy wing sharpshooters in traps in Browns Valley Road area of Vacaville, which is right next to Napa. In the weeks since, the county has increased the number of traps and checks them often. The count of the past have gone up to 40, and that also including a number of egg masses, and they do breed prolifically. So, cooler weather keeps the insects fairly dormant. So we're going into cooler weather there, but it doesn't stay cool forever. There, it's going to warm up, and it said it could take up to two years to eradicate the, all of them. Uh, residential areas are uh, keeping an eye on everything. Said that the uh, uh, glasswing sharpshooter, let me give you a little background. It's uh, native to the southeastern U.S. and parts of Mexico. It's about one and a half inches long and it's uh, it flies. It usually gets transported around the area through nursery deliveries and nursery plants and stuff like that. And that's why California inspects it so thoroughly. It's part of the leafhopper family, and they can fly. One of two members of the leafhopper family that can fly. They can spread pierce disease all over the place really, really fast. Once a vineyard gets pierce disease, it starts withering and yellowing and it dies nothing you can do about it in 1999 great growers in temecula which is down by riverside county in southern california lost 300 plus acres of grapevines to pierce disease so there's never been an infestation in napa but the county right next door the proximity of solano county is something that they're all a little concerned about, to say the least. Uh, Napa has approximately 46,000 acres of vines planted. And, you know, you start getting the glasswing sharpshooter in there. And the sad thing is about the glasswing sharpshooter, you can't spray and it's gone. It goes through like a five-stage cycle in its life. And you have to spray and kill it in I think three of those stages it'll die but there's other two stages will not die because it's an egg stage and a uh, pupa stage and so because it won't die in those stages you can spray it but if there's anything in those stages they'll come out and start all over again so it's a it's a continuous monitoring of this it's uh they said they can't let their guard down. It's, the surveillance is going on all the time. They said that everyone yeah, that lives there, keep an eye on it. Watch for them. Be sure that they're not around. Look for them in the trees. Look for them around and all that. And if you see anything that you might resemble it, take a picture of it and send it to the, oh, well, you can send it to the, uh, local ag center or to the one well, that probably be the best and picture the local ag center uh, and they'll take care of it and come in and probably put traps and all sorts of stuff but 
the glassy wing sharpshooter is now in Solano County, right next to to Napa, which is oh my gosh, not a good thing. Archaeologists found a winery, well, the remains of a winery that's over 1,500 years old. And it's a wine factory that was found in Israel, uh, the largest known winery from that era. Uh, it's uh, right outside of, I don't know. Uh, I read this earlier, and I can't remember where it says now. Oh, Yavne. Y A V N E. I guess it, I mean, it's in central uh, Israel, and it's uh, seventy-five thousand square foot winery. Seventy-five thousand. The factory produced over a half million gallons per year. They figure. Uh, they figure it was bottled and shipped out around the areas there. Uh, surprised to discover a sophisticated factory that used to produce wine in commercial quantities. Uh, so it's, uh, they said, you got to remember it was all done manually. There wasn't any machines or anything to do that. So it was all done manually. Archaeologists dug, uh, in Israel and local municipalities and nonprofits have helped and they, uh, the area has become a tourist draw. The digs are also known for fascinating finds, uh, which, have included a rare 2,700-year-old toilet in Jerusalem and a 1,600-year-old multicolor mosaic in the town of Yavni. So, uh, oh, here's one. And a fully intact 1,000-year-old chicken egg. But a enormous winery of over 75,000 square feet, I think, is more exciting than a thousand-year-old chicken egg. Uh, the um, uh, wines, they say, were considered good, and it was a white wine um, because they everything that they found is not giving them red wine to leave color pigmentations on it. And these are funny white. So uh, they said it was uh, something that nobody drank water they would drink wine. Even children was wine drinkers in uh, ancient areas there. And so it was made for everybody. It was the drink as opposed to using water, which was usually not good. So, uh, brand new discovery, a 75,000 square foot, 1,500-year-old winery in Israel, outside the city of Yavna, did I say? Uh, Yavni. So, cool. I just thought that was very interesting. Uh, okay. This is Alcohol Law Review. Put this out. Amicus briefs filed in 7th Circuit. Filed in Seventh Circuit on case related to challenge to Indiana retail delivery laws. Now the I've got some other stuff about the Supreme Court and the ruling there, but this is this is not Supreme Court. This is the Seventh District Court in Indiana, and it says Chicago Wine Company and others had filed a dormant. Commerce Clause challenge against the governor and other members of the state of Indiana. Now, the Commerce Clause, we had a guest on, an ex-state representative, who said the Commerce Clause states that one state cannot impede the shipping of items into their state from another state. It's open, open borders, okay? So the Commerce Clause says you have to let me ship stuff in there. When they stop wine from coming in, that is in violation of the Commerce Clause. But it's pretty much ignored. Well, this is, they're following, they're calling it the dormant Commerce Clause, which is pretty much true. But the district court ruled for Indiana on the dormant 
dormant commerce clause claims relating to delivery and importing. And now the plaintiffs have sought review on these matters. Okay, so this is what goes on. Whenever you put anything in court, uh, somebody rules this way and somebody rules that way and somebody rules this way and finally goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decides if they're going to see the case or not. And a lot of times they don't. And so it goes back to the last ruling. State of Indiana and Intervening Wholesale Association have also filed their joint brief to try to get this suit taken care of. It says, amicus briefs is filed and accepted by the Seventh Circuit Court, by the Center of Alcohol Policy, as well as a brief by Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America and American Beverage Licensee. So the whole thing is being joined by lots of important people in the wine business. It's uh, going to affect not just Illinois or Indiana, but also Texas, because Texas has a uh, lawsuit that was dropped by the courts and Texas is going, well, look, if you're pursuing this, I want ours to look at again also. But basically, both complaints allege that the state laws that do not favor their business model violate the Dormant Commerce Clause and also violate the Privileges and Immunities Clause in Article 4 of the United States Constitution. The Dormant or, or the Dormant Commerce Clause, okay, but the Privilege and Immunities Clause, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm not sure. Both the Fifth Circuit Court and Seventh Circuit have previously addressed these issues, but that was before the recent Supreme Court decision in Tennessee Wine Retailers Association. And that's where they said that they couldn't stop them. So, free trade in alcohol across the country is what attorneys are looking for they don't want this state by state stuff they want free trade but when they start doing that it's going to go across against the uh what is the 22nd amendment that repels prohibition so when they start changing that they're going to have to start looking at that so it's 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 like wow ongoing continuous stuff that we're involved with because if you live in any of those states where they're not letting you do it, then it's going to be something you're not being able to do, which, you know, as simple as that. Okay, let me see. I got some other stuff here. Let me go back and find it and see what. Why is that taking a double click now? Never used to. Um, let's see. Where is this? Uh, mm, okay. All drinking increases heart disease risk. A report that just came out, 2019, came out with any alcohol, any drinking, increases your risk of heart disease. <coughs> Excuse me. But not so fast. New study says that that's not true. It says wine's protective effects against heart disease was well, came into question, but the study was a little unsound methodology. It says the 2019 research conducted by a team at Oxford enrolled over 500,000 adults from 10 countries. Or, I'm sorry, from 10 areas of China, well, not countries, and recorded alcohol consumption and cardiovascular disease incidents over the course of 10 years. Researchers use a type of genetic epidemiology, epidemiological analysis, I said that wrong, known as medallion randomization to examine the data. Genetic uh, epidemiology looks not just at who gets sick, but at genetic factors to try and understand what roles genes play and what role environmental factors play, hence drinking. They found that the J-shaped relationship between alcohol and stroke risk, uh, non-drinkers 
faced a slightly higher risk of heart attack and strokes than heavy drinkers. So the J-shaped relationship they're saying is shows that the non-drinkers were on the upper end of the J, whereas the other end was the heavy drinkers. Let me click on this and see if it gives a... Yeah. Grape con- Yeah, this just goes in and tells you more detail. Grape compounds could help with depression. More good news for your mind. Moderate drinking might help clean the brain. Uh, and there's just a couple articles that are in association with this one. But the uh, new study shows are the reviewing that study shows that drinking does not increase health problems. All drinking does not increase health or heart disease risk either. I mean, it just doesn't affect it like they uh, came up with. Uh, it says, what we have shown is that when the underlying relationship between an exposure and an outcome is J-shaped, which it shouldn't be, it should be equal, then the type of analysis carried out in the Lancet paper can potentially turn this J-shaped relationship into a relationship that is linear. We use simple examples to demonstrate this. So I am confident that we that this could have, have happened in 2019 paper. So they're saying it could have happened, but it's not possible to really base the fact that the alcohol or drinking wine will not help lower blood risk or stroke risk or heart disease and stuff like that. So good news, again, good news for wine drinkers. As always, we have good news for wine drinkers, as we find quite often. Uh, and let's see, let's see the next crush, next crush. Oh, where is that? Uh, oh, a tanker truck spilled on Santa Maria Highway. This was just a couple of days ago. Let's see, this is this is dated. The 20th, so this just happened a couple of days ago. A uh, tanker truck filled with grape juice uh, that was crushed and ready to go to uh, a winery crashed, fell over, blocked lanes. They were able to stop the flow. Uh, they only lost about five gallons, but it blocked traffic for over six hours. No one was injured, but... Uh, only five gallons lost in a great big tanker truck. That's amazing. But uh, I just, I saw that and it caught my eye. Let me go to something else here. Why is this needing double click? All right. Now, this one, I said something last week about shortages coming up. And this is one of the repercussions of it. Glass bottle shortage. And I mentioned that last week. They can't get glass bottles everywhere. Well, this is creating a problem already. A shipping crisis and global shortages of products key to bottling wine has some winemakers scrambling. It says, without bottles, wine often sets in barrels for longer, which can make it taste like a sawmill. The shortage is so severe that one winery resorts to buying bottles from another vineyard's name on it. Wow. And so they're labeled on top of that. Supply chain. I mentioned last week how horrible it is right now. Well, it is full of glass bottles. I used to get my bottles out of Mexico. I don't know why they're shipping them across sea. Maybe it's cheaper in the long run. I don't think so because I checked prices all over the place trying to find the cheapest I can get glass and I was getting them out of Mexico and they were a lot cheaper there than anywhere else 
It says a dire shortage in glass bottles is forcing some winemakers to let wine age in wooden barrels for too long, which can lead to the drink tasting like a sawmill. With prices of nearly every good needed to bottle wine soaring, the vineyards may eventually be compelled to raise the price of wine as well. Yes, people, it does affect you. All this stuff when it comes to wine will affect you and everything else. Too. The cost of glass has skyrocketed by 45% compared to 2019. But most wineries have resisted raising the prices so far, which doesn't mean that they won't. Uh, a uh, One individual here by the name of uh, Phil Long, who is the owner of Longevity Wines, says, I'm not sure how long I can hold prices where they are. Glass is a main ingredient to bottling. Imagine you're a cookie company and there was no flour. And that's just really a problem. Uh, too much oak will throw the wine out of balance. And so therefore, it they don't want to leave them in the oak barrels, but there's no other place to put them. Uh, bottles aren't the only item in short supply. When asked by which other items are scarce right now, uh, Lyle Davis, who's the owner of Corner 103 Winery, responded by saying, everything is. So, and it will affect you. It will affect you in prices. And that's really where it's going to do, because they're not going to be able to set on this and not raise their prices. Um, it's And when the items do come in, they are more expensive. Um, container ships are jammed up at the ports right now, and there they're, says it used to take them hours to come in and unload. Now it's taken weeks to get them in and unload because of labor shortages on the docks and all that. So if you start seeing your favorite wine, which you've bought for years at $10, $12 a bottle and $15 a bottle, and all of a sudden it's another 4 or $5 a bottle more, then there's not much that can be done about That's what's going to happen. We don't have glass. We don't have labels. We don't have all that stuff. I was talking about that last week, and here is a good example of it happening. Okay. Uh, Representative, where is he? Where are you, Representative? Uh, there he is. Spotted lantern fly. We've talked about the spotted lantern fly before, too. This is another nasty bug that is working its way around the country more and more and more in different areas. That also will die in cold weather, but it's spreading a lot, said the spotted lantern fly has the potential to decimate the states. Uh, this is talking about New York state as the potential to decimate the state's grape, fruit, and forestry industries, which play a critical role in the overall agriculture economy. New York produces more than 30 million bushels of apples each year. And New York's grapes are valued at harvest at $52.8 million annually. The state's maple and timber industries would be negatively impacted by continued spread of the spotted lanternfly. Continued efforts, including research, prevention methods, and funding are all needed to help stop the spread and to ensure New York's agriculture industry will not fall prey to the spotted lanternfly. Yes, it is getting worse. Representative uh, of uh, New York, a Congressman, uh, what's his first name? I don't know. I can't find it. Joe. Congressman Joe Morell, or Morale, M-O-R-E-L-L-E. -E, I don't know how I pronounce it, Morell or Morale or whatever. He said that uh, need to kill it. He said the hops industry in New York continues to grow to support the nearly 500 breweries in the state. And he says, since 2013, the hops industry has grown from zero to 300 acres today. And the spotted lanternfly has now been discovered in the southern tier, and it continues to migrate north at a frightening pace. He said the congressman is act asking for more money from the state and help from the federal government 
to eradicate the spotted lantern fly. Uh, it says successful in securing $4 million last year uh, from the state, but he said that they actually need a lot more and need to ramp up the methods that they use and everything to kill it. He says, if you believe you have encountered a spotted lantern fly or SLF eggs, you're advised to follow these steps. Point, crush the bug using your foot, a swatter, or other means. Point, report the sighting by sending a photo to spottedlanternfly at agriculture.ny.gov and note the location in your message. Point, inspect and continue to monitor the surrounding area for signs of the SF, uh, SLF which includes sap oozing from wounds and tree trunks, honeydew buildup under plants, waxy and mud-like buildup indicating an egg nest. And point, remain diligent as the SLF is mostly spread through human activity, such as being transported on cars and vehicles. So he's saying, and then that goes for the glass wing sharpshooter too. You know, the, all these, all these are good good ideas but spotted lantern fly is started in pennsylvania and it's worked its way over to new york now and it's got new york all the industries in new york a little bit concerned uh invasive species well i'll tell you what the invasive species in this country uh, play havoc absolutely play havoc on uh native so living here in florida we are constantly hearing about the snakes down in the Everglades and how they're eating up the Everglades of everything down there. Uh, boa constrictors are just taking over the Everglades. Invasive species. So, let's see. Do I something else here? Yeah, I think I do. I'll get something else before I say goodbye. A couple more things. Uh, oh, direct to consumer wine. You know, we talked a little bit about that tonight. So I won't get into that again. But let's see. I've got a couple of wineries to talk about here. Tassel Ridge Winery uh has open, uh located in Iowa. Wine tasting by reservation only. Uh, so they've got that, so you can come in by reservation, but I think they'll take reservations any time. If you see you're going to be in that area, call them up, and you can probably get in. Plus, they have shipping, and they got uh, uh, 50% off shipping with a 12 bottle purchase, and they've got all sorts of stuff going on there. They always do. They're, they're uh, always a busy winery. They're located southeast of Des Moines, and in Iowa, and you can visit them at tasselridge.com. I think it is, yeah. Um, Tassel Ridge, or is it tasselridgewinery.com? I always get these things confused. Tasselridge.com, okay, not winery. So you can get a hold of them there if you're in that area. Uh, let's see, I've got a couple more here I thought okay no 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 well I guess I don't I thought I had another winery that was having something happening no I guess not so hmm. I think we're done for the evening I... okay uh, yeah. finish uh winery events okay um we are uh closing out the show today it is um thursday i almost said february october 21st and um <laughs> i don't know why i was like all of a sudden i, I almost belt out february it's february 21st <laughs> thursday, <laughs> 2025 <laughs> thank you all for tuning in <laughs> really mess yeah, them up go. what <laughs> five, five, five yeah. years ago we had a five. rough time with covid but oh do you all, all over, yeah do y'all remember that time <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You remember? Remember back then? Yeah. Wow, what a memory. <laughs> um, yeah. We will close the show down, and uh, we will see you all next Thursday, uh, which is October 28th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, thank you, as always, for tuning in and uh, for, for being out there and, and uh, just, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, it always uh, is great to see that uh, people are listening to the show. So uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yes, if, you have, if you have questions or comments or, you know, someone uh, or yourself would like to be a guest on the show, please, please, please email. Uh, Ron gets the emails at allaboutwine101 at gmail. Dot com. Very simple. All about wine 101 at gmail dot com. Uh, and uh, let them know, uh, you know, what what you're into uh, uh, in the wine industry or, uh, you know, that you're tuned in where you're listening from, that kind of stuff. And it's always get, you know, great to get that uh, feedback. So, uh, yeah, just uh, communicate. Yeah. yeah, let us know. And uh, we'll tune in next week. Be safe and uh, have a great uh, have a great week weekend coming up. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. And I have to go back to hit the button. Here we go. It did make it. This concludes tonight's broadcast of All About Wine with your host, Ron. For show information, links to All About Wine on Twitter and Facebook, or to be a guest on this show, visit the show website at www.allaboutwinebtr.com. Archive shows are available for download on iTunes or on our show page at blogtalkradio.com forward slash all about wine. Thank you for listening. Drink responsibly, and we'll see you next time on All About Wine. About Wine. That was loud.